taste uh, the uh, tour in Thai, uh, for giving opportunity for practical science to host this meeting. Uh, we are very fortunate in this for being picked as the venue for this very important lecture. Not only, I think Professor Lane will give us, I'm sure, a very stimulating lecture, judging from the audience, all of the students as well as staff today. During the past week, we have been selling your name and your face all over the campus. And every student walking around will see posters with your face on it. So people now will look at Professor Lane and will now see him in person. And perhaps they will be wondering within one day that I will be winning the Nobel Prize. That, that, that's a student's thinking, I hope. However, the, the old staff probably will be thinking after today's lecture, because Dr. Lane is known not only as scientist, not only as researcher, but a very, very excellent communicator. So perhaps the old minds, the staff probably will see Professor Lane and say, how would we educate young person? And I think we will learn all of that today. But before our formal introduction to Professor Lane, perhaps uh, we'd like to invite uh, Professor Pinawat to uh, give an opening address because actually today it's in TRF day, not, not the fact of science day, Professor Pinawat. Professor Lane, distinguished scientists, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you are all here not to hear my speech, so I will just say that I on behalf of the Thailand Research Fund, we very much appreciate the chance to be a co-sponsor of this very unique uh, lecture. And we hope to be a partner of both PAST and the Faculty of Science at the University for future activities. Thank you very much. I will not also do a long introduction. Uh, because Professor Lin said he will talk for three hours with a break between. So, so I will do a very short introduction. Uh, as we were going through his uh, bibliography, uh, Professor Lin has exemplified, I think, one of the most uh, outstanding uh, scientists, one of the most outstanding chemists. Uh, he is presently at the University of Strasbourg, of course. And uh, uh, during his childhood career, he he is known for his excellence as a pianist and organist. So he played piano and organ uh, very well, and I am sure that he, he still kept that up. Uh, that was his major interest during his uh, since his childhood day. When he when he came into college, he not even know at that time that he will go into chemistry. However, I think. Uh, he has bought himself a, a, a kit, I don't know what it's like, but he said it's a, it's a, a chemistry kit where he do experiments at home. Uh, I don't know how many of, this, uh, of our young undergrad students have chemistry kits and do experiments at home. Perhaps if you start doing that, maybe one of these days you will be winning a Nobel Prize. So, so after the lecture today, go to the store and buy a chemistry kit and do experiments. <laughs> But make sure that don't the same experiment. So his interest in, in chemistry started when he was doing his uh, um, BSc uh, degree in, in organic chemistry. And after he finished his bachelor degree, he go on to do his doctorate degree in 1960 at the CNRS uh, in France. Uh, he started his PhD in 1960. I don't know how many graduate students sitting here. In 1960, he started his doctorate degree. In 1961, he published his first paper on the uh, uh, substitution of steroid derivative. I don't know how many of you here uh, be able to publish during after the first year of your doctorate degree. If, if you have not done this, because after the lecture, you go to the lab and perhaps start thinking about publishing your first paper. Maybe, maybe soon you will be winning your Nobel your, 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 your Prize. <laughs> after, after, after he finished his uh, PhD, he went to, to uh, do his post postdoctoral at Harvard. And during that, this time, then uh, he get uh, to work on vitamin B12 and the famous uh, 
Kaufman Woodward and Kaufman uh, rules at FEB were to accustom himself with. Uh, after that, he go back and become a full professor at uh, in, in struggle and as in Paris. Uh, he during after going back to, to France, then uh, he began interest in biology problems. Uh, his work in chemistry is excellent, but his interest has gone on uh, neural cells as well as in photosynthesis. I don't know how many of our chemists is interested in biology. Uh, if chemists want to win a Nobel Prize, we have to, have to start thinking about interest in biology. So, with his interest in biology, I think that's come his lecture today, the, the Supra Molecule. Uh, he has been visiting professors in many places, including Howard University, of course, ETS in Zurich, the University of Cambridge, as well as in Barcelona and Frankfurt. So, he has, he has been visiting professors all over the world, and we are very happy to have Professor Lane with us today. We are looking forward for this lecture and for his uh, future contribution to our faculty as well. Please welcome Professor Lane. Please. I would like to thank the TRF Fund, which is organizing the host institution here, Maidan University, for hosting you and me, and all those who have come from other universities around Bangkok. Uh, and of course, the starting point was the organization of this series of lectures by the uh, International Peace Foundation, which uh, pursues the objective of trying to implement intellectual activity, including science, in furthering the goal of peace. But today, we will talk much more about hardcore science. Don't be afraid. <laughs> and you are in for three hours. Don't be afraid. <clears throat> um, it happens, um, we have been told, that I am professor at the Collège de France in Paris. My laboratory is in Strasbourg. When we teach in Paris, we are uh, do to do in the year about nine or ten lectures, not so many as you can see, but each year that would be different. And we can do outside Paris a number of our lectures. So I've been going around the world giving some Collège de France lectures in other places, and I chose Bangkok for this series, so three lectures. I have been in Prague, in Alexandria, in uh, Barcelona, in many places, Amsterdam, to give lectures. And I think it's the first time in Asia that I'm giving these lectures. So they are really chemistry lectures. Right? It's a course. It's not a general talk. OK? Uh, it has been mentioned that uh, I have been doing chemistry from very early on, it's true, it's true. I had uh, bought some, but they didn't uh, buy a chemistry set because at that time they didn't exist. You had to go to the local drugstore and buy ether, alcohol, whatever you could get. Put it together and do the experiment. The first experiment went bad. It burned down, but okay. <laughs> That's the way you learn. So try not to burn it down, the first one. And what I'm going to do today is to give you an overview of this area which has been developing over the last um, about now close to 40, let's say 35 years, which is termed supramolecular chemistry. And I would like to show you some of the illustrations, the steps it has gone through, and also point out some of the possible perspectives. Um, I have chosen some uh, specific topics I give me some other lectures. I don't know yet exactly how much I will be able to cover today here, but I will give you some other lectures, especially at biotech, for instance, where I will be speaking on contributions to biotechnology and nanotechnology. Now, chemistry, especially organic chemistry, is 
the art and science of understanding the structure and the transformation of the matter. You have compounds, you want to know how they are constituted. And you want to learn how you transform one given compound into another one. The first one is analyzing structures. The second one, the ability to perform transformations, to do chemical reactions, <coughs> mixing things together and being able to understand, often predict, but not always, what's coming to happen and what you get out, is something really fantastic and basic to chemistry. And that is really what can be turned on, turned on for chemistry. You feel that you have the ability to make new materials out of other ones. It's really quite a powerful science in that respect. And you don't just do it by, when you take wood, you can make a table, you can make a chair and so on. That's not chemistry. Chemistry, you do the insides. The real constitution of matter is modified by what chemists can do. This science of uh, understanding how you can transform matter, matter being constituted of molecules, is a science of rearranging the atoms which constitute the molecules. And this has become to be known as molecular science, the way in which we can construct from the basic bricks, the atoms, more and more and more complicated molecules. And over 150 years or so, chemists have learned how to do that. It started, let's say, with the synthesis of urea by Böhler in Germany in 1828, very simple compound, as all of you must know, urea. And then it went through progressive um, evolution, getting more and more powerful, up to uh, one of the milestones, which I can mention, which is vitamin B12, which you see here. Vitamin B12, which was synthesized, I mention it because uh, it is considered as one of the milestones of organic synthesis, where the construction of this complicated molecule was realized by the combined efforts of uh, two groups, The group of Robert Woodward at Harvard and that of Albert Eschen Moser at the TH in Zurich. I was at that time postdoc with Woodward and I did this thing. This is my work here. This ring. But you know, it took about 120 men and women years to make it. It's about 12 persons for 10 years. But this is not the end of organic synthesis. Since then, since the 1970s when this has been made, a lot of other progress has been made and more complicated, much more complicated molecules than B12 have been synthesized. Many new reactions have been discovered. So molecular chemistry, the art and science of making very complicated, constructing very complicated molecular structures by a number of very new, powerful, efficient, selective chemical processes, that's a field which is well developed. It's of course not finished. There would be many new reactions discovered, many new processes discovered, many new materials made, many new drugs invented, and so on. But it's an adult science, a powerful adult, mature science. So then one can ask the question, once molecular science is so well established, what else can one think of doing? And uh, the question then comes, is there something we should be looking at beyond molecular science. Let me introduce that just by something which you might consider as not being chemistry. What you see here doesn't seem, doesn't look like chemistry, but it is. The blue sphere is a cancer cell, a tumor cell. The violet type of bodies are killer cells. Killer cells are cells which in our body are, so to say, the policemen. They run around, go around, they find out what is not so good, what has changed, and they, their job is to destroy it. But the question is, how does a killer cell know the other one is a cancer cell? What tells the killer cell that the other one is a transformed tumor cell and not a healthy cell? If they make a mistake, they're in trouble. They must not make a mistake. How does this happen? 
second example I would take is this one where you see here a um, thing which is, let's turn it the other way around, probably easier to see. It's a white blood cell which has been covered in rows just to make it nice, I suppose. And the blue dots are the AIDS virus. The AIDS virus is sitting on it and will infect it, penetrate into the cell. How does the AIDS virus, one, knows that that's the white blood cell, and second, how does it get into? What's the way? If we look a bit more carefully, more precisely, at what the virus looks like, very schematically, The virus is uh, composed of a shell and inside this the shell is the membrane of the virus and inside the shell is the genome, the genetic information of the virus. In the membrane are stuck these globular type of objects which in fact are a very, very schematic representation of complicated proteins. So these are these proteins. There's one of them whose scientific name is GP120, glycoprotein 120, which is, so to say, the hand of the virus, the eye. The hand is better than the mouse. This GP120 sits, feeds around the cells, and when it finds the counterpart, which is CD4, on the white blood cell, then it knows if I may say so, that has reached the target. We will sit on it and then by a complicated mechanism penetrate. So, what we have seen already with this is that this possibility, this ability to penetrate the cell starts with a contact between the molecules present in the virus and the molecule target present in the cell. Which means us immediately realize one thing, that both in the killer cell, cancer cell interaction, the virus, white blood cell interaction, like also when you get vaccinated, in the antibody antigen interaction, what is important is that molecules attach to one another. But they attach to one another, the molecule of one body, attaches to the molecule of the other entity. And this happens in a very selective fashion. We don't want to make a mistake. So we realize that beyond the chemistry of the molecules as an entity, there is a chemistry to be understood and developed, which is the chemistry of what happens between molecules. What happens when molecules get together? When they get together, they have to do that in a very selective fashion, and therefore, beyond molecular chemistry, there's an area which you may call, which you have called supramolecular chemistry, because it lies beyond molecular chemistry on a level where the, uh, the problem is not anymore just what a molecule is, but what happens when molecules are in an assembly. Sometimes I call it a molecular sociology. Molecules may like each other, may hate each other, in other words, attract, repel, transform. And this happens in a very selective fashion. We know that, for instance, from biology, since biological organisms are all composed of molecules, obviously. And therefore, there is uh, the idea that there is a field which one should develop, which is the one concerned with what happens between molecules. Now, it's quite clear that this field of supramolecular chemistry, which lies beyond the molecular chemistry, has to deal with molecular interactions. I suppose all of you are chemists, at least I admit it. And therefore, the construction of molecules relies on making covalent bonds between atoms. Here now we deal with non-covalent bonds with bonds which link molecules together. 
by non-covalent interactions, and we'll come back to those. In other words, the, the, the goal is now to construct a chemistry at the supramolecular level using non-covalent interactions, like the molecular chemists are constructing a chemistry at the molecular level using covalent bonding between atoms. And that's the area which has developed. Um, I give you just an hour rundown or panorama of what has developed because I haven't time to go through all the details, of course. But let me just tell you about the panorama. Panorama is the following. Once we know that we have to try to understand selectivity and binding between molecular entities, we can figure out that we should try to make receptor molecules, molecules able to bind substrate entities. Of course, we use covalent synthesis, normal molecular synthesis, and we take advantage of all the progress made in that field for constructing these receptors. They bind, hopefully, given substrate, that's the goal, through these non-covalent bonding interactions. This leads to a supramolecular entity. And these entities can have several features, several properties. The basic property is recognition. We come back to that at length. Selective binding. The second one is transformation, when the receptor binds the substrate and leads to a transformation on the bound substrate. The third one is translocation or transport, when the receptor picks up another entity and leads it, helps it to go through a membrane, membrane transport systems. Once you understand these processes, especially recognition, you can then try to go one step further even and use molecular recognition to induce self-organization. This should be the last part of my lectures. Now, let's have a look at this most basic process which we recognize is at the origin of the selective binding, for instance, of a cell to another one. Molecular recognition is this selective process by which a given molecule selectively binds another one. What does it imply? It implies interaction energy because you have to bind non-covalent interactions. But something very important, and probably in some respects one of the key features which uh, supramolecular chemistry has introduced into chemistry is the notion that recognition implies information. Of course, this is, was there all the time, but it's important to realize in a, to be perfectly aware of the fact that in order to recognize you need information and therefore a molecular system which does a recognition process has an information content which means that it is an information process something which nowadays I suppose should also be very interesting for young people, young students, they like to play with computers, true, computers are information storage systems, processing systems, but molecules do that all the time. Molecules contain information and they process it by the interactions, they then know how to distinguish one thing from something else. Now how can we define this, how can we define in a rather simple fashion this information process? We can consider that it relies on a sort of a generalized complementarity in geometry, the shape, the size of the entities in presence, and of interactions, the fact that some interactions, uh, some binding points have to be in contact in order to lead to uh, binding. The simplest image, but a very powerful image, has been already announced by Emil Fischer in 1894, when he said that for an enzyme to act on its substrate, they have to fit together like a lock and a key. 
It's a very simple image, but very powerful and very clear. That's one thing I can easily keep, you can easily keep in your mind, a lock and a key. If you have the right key, you can open the lock. And that's exactly, uh, exactly. It's a good image for at least the basis of molecular recognition. And for instance, quite clear, a drug which acts on your organism, on the target, is a key which is being interacting with a given lock. Here is their old Emil Fischer. He got his PhD in Strasbourg, so I'm proud of that. <coughs> After that, he left, unfortunately, to Munich. But he, he was in Strasbourg from 1870 to 1874. You know, of course, that chemists have to simplify their very complex chemical substances are very complex things. You can try to describe them by quantum mechanical equations and you get the wave function. But the wave function you cannot handle it very easily. So chemists have found it very practical to cut down energies in different specific types. Of course, everything is contained in the wave function, that Schrodinger would say. But you have to cut it into specific type of interaction in order to be able to handle it in your brain. Very difficult to to overlap integrals in your brain. Computer does that better. So, uh, these supermolecular uh, recognition features rely on interaction patterns which are complementary, as I just said, and they use electrostatic patterns like charges and dipoles interacting, hydrogen bonding patterns like hydrogen bond acceptor, hydrogen bond donor sites, donor acceptor patterns, electron rich, electron poor sites. Van der Waals interactions, where shapes correspond to one another, by the Van der Waals forces, contact interactions, and of course, also very importantly, metal ion coordination. Metal ion coordination is uh, important, as you will see, because it also provides quite good interactions and the way to handle recognition processes and interactions in the chemistry called coordination chemistry, which makes use of organic molecules and of metal ions. So the first point I can make is that, indeed, chemistry is indeed also an information science. It's not only a science of matter and of energy, it means objects and binding of objects, but it contains information. The information is stored at the molecular level, hardcore, the hardware is the molecule, the software is the supramolecular interactions, that's the processing of the information. And that's also a way, I think, to present chemistry to the younger generation, which is sort of crazy about computers. Molecules do a lot of computing. Now, as you will suddenly experience, do research work, when you want to understand a complicated problem, the first thing is to try to simplify it, understand it at a more simple level, and then reconstruct the complexity. And this is then, as a first step, let's try to understand molecular recognition. That's also a free lesson in French. Not much, but it's easy, easy French to understand, yeah? Oh, you know French. Uh, you see, when you want to learn French and you know English, you just turn the words around and it works. Molecular receptor is receptor molecular. And association selection, no difficulty, okay? So you know some French already. So that's uh, the lock, and the lock has a cavity, and these are three keys, and it's quite obvious that the red key is the one which can fit into the lock. So let's now ask the question, if you want to understand these lock and key complementarities and see how we can handle do something with them, let's choose a very simple key and build the lock for that key. What's the simplest object in three-dimensional space? It is a sphere. Okay, nothing simple. Sphere is the simplest. So, where are the spheres in chemistry? 
Let's choose spheres and then see if we can perform a recognition process on spheres. Where are the spheres in chemistry? They are simple. The series of alkali ions, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, are spheres. One column to a Mendeleev table. Spheres is one charge, fine. They increase in size. So you can say, okay, I have now spherical objects, and what I can do is to try to recognize them by their size. The only thing that changes the size, charge remains one plus. It was also very interesting, that's where how our work started, and it was mentioned that I was interested in <coughs> neurological processes and things like that. And you know, if you are a chemist, either you drop chemistry and start neurobiology all over again, or you try to use your chemistry to go into the area and bring something new into it. And I felt that the way to do it is to do the following. The transmission of the neural system, of the neural influx along the nerve, depends on changes of concentration of sodium and potassium. It's an ionic current. Sodium and potassium ions changing concentration and running along and transmitting the signal. So sodium and potassium is very, very important. How can you recognize sodium from potassium? Your neural membranes must contain molecules which are able to do it, not you get a trouble, have a short circuit somewhere. In addition, they spend your sodium in blood. Potassium is very <coughs> important for muscles, the heart, for instance. So in this series, the whole series was interesting for academic reasons, and it was interesting for biological reasons because of sodium potassium. And of course, if we go back to their old email, we would say, okay, we have spherical keys, let's build a spherical block. Now this picture is not so nice, it's a bit dark on one side here. But you may see here, if you represent this, that the block would be a sphere, it has a cavity inside, and you want to put into this cavity the ion. We call that a krypton, because it's a crypt, it's a cavity, and the resulting the entity after introducing the substrate would be the cryptate. So, in 1967, we synthesized, long time ago, most of you were not born, <laughs> but that's unfortunately the way it goes. We made this molecule, which could, is able to take up an eye inside the cavity, the X-ray structure, the structure in the solid state here, is this one. And when rubidium is introduced, you get this cryptate. This confirmed the formation. What about the strength of binding? Let me just here point out the general factor, which is the following. Charles Peterson had made these chronesis cyclic compounds with oxygen. The oxygens are sites which electri electrically, electrostatically interact by ion-dipole interactions with the bound ions. And if you go from a chain, you see this is broken here, from a chain to a ring, you gain 10 to the 4 in strength of binding. When you go from a ring with a, a side chain to our krypton, you now gain 10 to the 5. So it is justified to make this much more complicated molecule, synthetically also more complicated, because you gain an enormous stability, 10 to the 5. So it's much better bound. That's good. That's the first step. But that is not enough, because you want also to this for potassium binding, potassium ion binding. You want to control the selectivity. In other words, to adjust the lock so as to bind different keys. This can be done by just taking the same kind of molecules and changing the length of the bridges by reducing or increasing the number of these entities. So it's smaller, the cavity is smaller, shorter, the cavity is smaller, the longer the cavity is larger. Very simple. You have just to synthesize the molecules again, and then you stop it. And then, 
I can show you first on molecular models what happens. If you look at the molecular models, the compound you already saw was this one, which had a rather large cavity. There is potassium inside this cavity here. This is potassium. You can shorten this bridge, and then the cavity is smaller, and you have sodium inside, which fits best. You can shorten these two bridges, the one in front and the one in the back, if you have a different see, you keep this constant. The cavity is now quite small, and now it's lithium inside. And that's exactly what happens if you study the strength of binding of lithium, sodium, potassium these molecules. You find exactly what I showed you. The smallest one binds specifically lithium, much better than sodium, much better than potassium, and not at all, ingredients is much too big. The second one binds sodium preferentially, the third one binds potassium preferentially. We have others also which bind those there, but uh, there's no need to go further in detail. So, this illustrates the process we may call spherical recognition, recognition of a sphere in the collection of spheres. Somewhat more complicated is the binding of tetrahedral substrates. How can we bind the tetrahedron? We have first to choose a tetrahedron, like the ammonium ion. That's a simple molecular tetrahedron, which has one positive charge, N, H, 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 one plus N. So what do we have to do? What we have to do is to devise a compound which will surround this ammonium ion in a tetrahedral fashion. So the principle is, let's construct a molecule which contains one, two, three, four binding sites exactly on the axis of the tetrahedron. We can, for stabilization reasons, complement these interactions by some more electrostatic interactions by oxygens, the red things are oxygens, the blue things are nitrogens. This is the model. Now how do you make a molecule which looks like that? This was synthesized at the beginning of the 70s, mid-70s, and here is this molecule, which does a very nice molecule. It is, let's say, a ring with a bridge in front and a bridge in the back. And if you look at it, this is flat as a representation, but it's not a flat molecule. These four nitrogens at the corners are located in a tetrahedral fashion, and there's a cavity inside. If we treat this with ammonium ions, the ammonium ions penetrate into the cavity and link up with the formers in the way shown here, where the ammonium is here, and it forms here one hydrogen bond, N plus HN, another one here, another one here, and the last one is in the back. The oxygens fit very nicely in here, these red oxygens, they also provide electrostatic stabilization. So everybody's very happy. The geometry is correct, the size is correct, the shape is correct, the size is correct, and the interactions are correct. And you need this entity here very strongly binds ammonium and selectively binds ammonium. It is also a nice illustration of why you should distinguish between molecules and supermolecules. Because the properties of these entities are not the same when they are free or when they are bound. When the ammonium is free, you know probably that the PKA, the basicity, is 9 point something. Around 9. But when it is bound here, it is so strongly stabilized in the ammonium form that the pKa becomes 15. In other words, in 10 molar base, you have still 50% protonated, which means how much the pKa bases, is acid-based properties of the supermolecule are different from the acid-based properties of the isolated objects. With this same molecule, one can do a lot of other things. Let me only summarize that on one transparency and indicate that, indeed, 
this is what we have seen, the interaction of one ammonium with the cavity inside. You can immediately realize that this is a tetrahedral recognition site. The receptor is able to recognize in a tetrahedral fashion. If you protonate twice this molecule, like here, in plus H and plus H, then the space inside is just good for water. And you need to find water very strong in this state. That's a very interesting process because in addition is cooperative, but it's something I'm trying to get into. And if you protonate it four times, now you bind chloride. There's no space anymore for getting something else in, just a hole. But now the hole is positively charged because it has four positive charges, and now it binds very selectively chloride ions. So we see that in this molecule we can go from binding of positively charged entity ammonium to a neutral one in water to negative one chloride. This then led to the idea that molecular recognition has of course also to be applied to negatively charged entities. I will come back to that in a moment. Or maybe I come back to that. Let's see. Ah, let me do it So we explored the possibility to also make compounds which will be able to bind anions, negatively charged groups. And for those of you who know enough biology, in fact, some of you know enough for that, in biology, there are many, many substrates which are negatively charged. DMP, ATP, ATP, citric acid, all these things are negative. So it's important to try to understand how to bind anions. And in this case, we were interested in playing the same game like with potassium, that like with lithium, sodium, potassium, and potassium, spheres positive charge, what about spheres of negative charge? Chloride, chloride, bromide, iodide. Here is the same substance which binds preferentially potassium, where the oxygens are replaced by nitrogens, can be protonated, and now form a very nice cavity which very strongly binds chloride, very strongly. About a thousand billion, 10 to the 12th stability constant for this binding. And here is the this is a structure which shows the binding of the fluoride inside the cavity. And of course, not surprisingly, when you increase the cavity size, then you bind fluoride, as shown here. Fluoride, that's again the crystal structure, fluoride inside the cavity. And you can continue this game and bind bromide and so on. Interestingly, when could also then try to go to another shape. This is a spherical anion. What about something else? Like a stick, a linear type, like a zit, N3 minus. N3 minus is linear, as you see here, N3 minus. This is now an ellipsoidal cavity where you have lengthened one axis, it's an ellipsoid, with a longer axis here and which has at each end of the molecule here two type of pincers. I don't know if you want to take a It holds the two ends in this way. And N3 minus can now penetrate into the cavity and is held inside at each end. And that's indeed what happens. So the structure resulting in this one, I don't have the crystal structure here, but all this has been done. You can determine the structure, confirm that it is correct. And indeed, N3 minus fits very nicely into this elongated cavity. So, this is the beginning of what you might call the recognition of a linear entity. On the area of more complicated molecular substrates, we then also constructed substances which look like a cylinder where you have a ring, you know what a cylinder is, of course, a circle on top, a circle on bottom, and here these are the lateral uh, branches of the cylinder, the height of the cylinder, height of the cylinder. You can regulate the distance between this and that by putting different groups here, thinner, longer is nothing, even longer bithinal, and even longer thinner. So the two rings, get further and further apart. If you choose these rings in such a way 
that they bind the ammonium, shown here. Then, of course, you can bind one on top, one on bottom, and between the two, the lengths of the group separating the two ammoniums must be compatible with our hydrocinium. And then you can take the game, and indeed, you do that. This compound with phenol binds best the ammonium with four CH2 groups, tetramethylene ammonium, naphthyl with five groups, <coughs> biphenol with seven, and terphenol with nine or ten. Mm -hmm. And this can be actually just the crystal structure of the one with five, so you have to convince you that indeed it works. This is the ammonium ion. This is a diammonium with one, two, three, four, five CH2s. And this is the crystal structure of that substance, nicely hanging, bound inside the cavity. And you, again, can do a selection of things. Now, these few examples, going from spherical to tetrahedral to linear, both on the positive side, cations, or the negative side, anions, illustrate how one can begin to understand the basis of molecular recognition. Of course, since then, many laboratories around the world have been interested and have worked in this area. I cannot cite them all, and there are many, very many. And for instance, let's give you, I'll give you just a short, brief selection of some of the substances which have been developed. Uh, this is cyclodextrin, a natural compound made of sugars, uh, which uh, they are form this cavity. These are calyxarines made by Gucci and many other people. These are derivatives made by Don Cram. This was made by André Fode in Paris, and this one by François Diderich in Zurich. But this is only a small selection. Many, many others have been done. And now one has in hand quite a number of in fact, many interesting results on the binding, selective binding of different entities on the basis of the principle of complementarity. And here I just illustrated by one example where, for instance, you could imagine that this looks like, and you can recognize what it could look like, tryptophan. This would be the indole group of tryptophan. This would be the carboxylate. This would be the ammonium of that amino acid. And of course, if you want to find that in a complementary fashion, for the, for the indole group, you need triplophilic site. For the carboxylate, you need something positive on the other side, capable of establishing nitrogen bonds. And for the ammonium <coughs> group, you need an ion site. This is just an illustration of the complementarity. And many of those experiments have now been done. They lead also to a number of, uh, uh, a number of uh, practical applications. In particular, the applications which one can see, and I guess you realize that, you can, you can try to make specific electrodes using a membrane. You introduce one of those recognition agents in the membrane, and then you can detect specifically given substrates. This was done for the potassium ions, for instance, where people have been using a number of uh, substrate, of, uh, artificial and natural receptors for making ion selective electrodes. And people have been, you may see the literature, many things, one can try to detect urea, one can try to detect uh, a given amino acid, one can try to detect a uh, given uh, type citric acid, and so on. Now, so much for the question of molecular recognition. This also led to another area which I would like to just present through some illustrations but give you a general idea about what is going on. Once you know how to handle this type of interactions, the next step would be to try to make them functional, to give them, in addition to binding, to give them perhaps some other function. This then led to the idea that it is possible, hopefully, to generate functional molecular and supramolecular devices. What is this? 
the general idea would be that you try to put together in a given system, a given structure organization, a positioning of components and in integrating it. This is, for instance, like, let's say, a fan. Now it's making air, making a fan. What is a fan? The function of the fan is to move air. You need, of course, uh, you need a helix. I mean, it is, uh, this is a gamma. Uh, it is, you know. And you need an uh, engine, you need electricity, you need wires. You, so you have different components. You want to organize them so that when it turns, it moves air. So, so like, let's say, a piano. And you have of course to go to the music, that's the function. You need keys, strings, hammers. So this is like a device. So the idea of a molecular device is you want to have components, you put them together in a correct fashion, and then you have a given function. And this function can have to do with photons, can have to do with electrons, ions and so on. The one I would like first to illustrate deals with photons. Let's have a look at photochemical molecular device. What was the idea here? Is to make a light converting device. A device which transforms a given light, not light, a given wavelength, into a light of another wavelength. And this, of course, any fluorescent molecule does that. A molecule which fluoresces, or a substance which phosphoresces, absorbs a given frequency and emits another one. But here, the idea would be that you want to separate functions. You would want to separate the absorption from the emissions of the field, optimize both, separate them. And this can be done, in principle, if you use the, if you cut it into pieces, and use three com uh, two components at least, an absorber, groups which will absorb light, an emitter, a group which will emit light, and between the two, you need energy transfer. You need the, that the energy absorbed by the antenna, this you can call the antenna collector, or the antenna air, uh, this time will be transferred to the emitter, and the emitter will emit light. Let me illustrate this by a specific case. Just a modification on the original cryptates, cryptans, where we replace the oxygen by the pyridine ring. So as to have on each branch what is called a bipyridine. Now for the coordination chemists here in the room, they know that bipyridine complexes are very interesting, very studied and so on, and we knew that bipyridines should be interesting binding groups for metal ions. In particular, you can think of introducing into the cavity metal ions which are luminescent, and they are very nice ones in the lanthanide series, like europium and terbium. And so we set up synthesizing complexes containing europium inside the cavity. The idea was light will be absorbed by the ligand, the energy will be transferred to the europium and this will emit. Indeed, when you make this europium triplate, you irrigate with light at 350 nanometers here, that's the excitation spectrum. You get an emission of red light, which is exactly the spectrum which you expect for European ions. This is a red, it has three lines in this red region. Now, what is interesting about that is the following. When you just dissolve European chloride in water, there's no emission. The reason is, that europium ion has a very low absorption coefficient, it's very inefficient in absorbing light. And second, the light which is absorbed, the energy is lost 
by a process which is not emissive. It doesn't give off light. Because the water of molecules, this is something to do with the physical chemistry of uh, hydrated europium, the vibrations of the OH provide a pathway which allows the energy to go out by a process which is non-emissive. So the idea was here to combine the good features of the European with the good features of the cage. When the European sits in the cage, water cannot approach anymore. So there's no destruction, so to say, of, uh, uh, of the excited state by the water molecules. Furthermore, the absorption coefficient, the efficiency in light absorption of the cage is 10 to the 4, 10,000 times better than the absorption of European. So provided your energy transfer is good enough, you will gain. For instance, since this is the absorption is 10,000 times better, if you have 10% transfer, you still gain a factor of 1,000. You lose a factor of 10, respect to the origin. In other words, by doing this, you have now obtained an entity which is a nicely fluorescent one where you have on one hand introduced and kept the good absorbing properties of the ligand, the good emission properties, red light, of the europium, and you make an energy transfer between the two. There's another property which is very important, which is the following. This again shows how you can set up a molecular device. The lifetime of the excited state of the ligand is something like a few nanoseconds. Very, very short. The lifetime of emission of europium is about microsecond, micro, micro, microseconds, many microseconds, hundreds of microseconds. So you see now, you now, by making a europium cryptate a capable of energy transfer, you gain, on one hand, the very high absorption of the ligand, the long lifetime and the red light of the emitter. And that gives you then an entity which has both good sex. It absorbs very well, emits red light with a long lifetime. Now this was purely on the basis of uh, studies which uh, were aimed at understanding the basic processes. And indeed, as you can see here, this is European chloride in water, that's European cryptic. It's easy to see that one emits the other one does not. So that was interesting. But what can you do with it? And what one can do, I would like to illustrate, because it also was important for us, uh, because it had an application, and it illustrates that basic research, you don't know where it leads you. You have something interesting, maybe you can find an application, or maybe somebody will help you to find an application. And I would like to very strongly stress that, that in these present days where everybody pushes you to have, to have applications, what it is useful for, of course one has to do it. But on the other hand, one must absolutely leave oneself free research, just to get new knowledge. And this is a case which for us led to things we did not, of course, predict at the beginning. It was developed in collaboration with uh, Dr. Gérard Matisse, a uh, researcher at the French company, and I will just quickly show you what it is because I think it's a good illustration. What did happen with was the development of a me method for medical diagnostics. The way it works is the following. When you want to do diagnostics, for instance, of cancer, the cancer is characterized by some specific molecules which you can detect. And if they increase in amounts and so on, then you know there may be a problem. But the other ones, of course, other cases, other sequences. So if this is the antigen, in other words, what you want to detect, you can generate an antibody to one epitope of this antigen. This is the antigen, a big protein, it has binding sites, and you generate an antibody 
to this. And you label this antibody with the European cryptic. This is it. You generate an antibody to another site which contains a secondary molecule, another acceptor, another light sensitive molecule. So what happens in the following? When the serum of the person you want to diagnose is not sick, then it does not contain the antigen. Okay? Which is uh, resulting from energy transfer from the European. So what can you do? If the normal emission of A has a very short lifetime, then normally it has short emission. When the emission of A comes from transfer of energy from here to here, it will necessarily have long lifetime because the energy comes slowly. If the European has a long lifetime, so this cannot emit faster than the European is delivering the energy. And therefore, if If the molecular acceptor is alone, then it's very short, 10 nanoseconds. If it occurs through the energy transfer mechanism, I just pointed out, it's very long, this emission, the emission of this entity. That's a global cryptate. This one absorbs light, transfers energy over here, and this emits very long. So you can do what one is called delayed fluorescence measurements. You wait for 10 or 20 nanoseconds, and then you measure. If there is no energy left, that means the lifetime is short. That means the person is not sick because there's no energy transfer. If the lifetime is long, then you know the antigen is present, and then you know that, in that case, the molecule you were looking for is present, and it can indicate that the person is sick. <coughs> this has been applied in many cases. I'll just give you one case to indicate what I can do. It's the case of uh, protein called the tumor necrosis factor, tumor necrosis factor alpha. This has epitopes, binding sites. You can generate an antibody to one site, this one, and you label it with a cryptate. You can generate an antibody to this site here, and you label it with this other acceptor, which happens to be a lot of protein and in fact, it's a tiny element here. And now, if this human tumor necrosis factor is present, this binds here, this binds here, absorbs light, transfer energy, this emits. And you can now diagnose for the presence or the absence of the tumor necrosis factor. This has then led to a machine, which is now in hospitals and used right around the world, and which allows the diagnosis by this. Um, antibody type of methodology using as labeling agent the urine. Now you realize immediately that we did not predict that this was possible. Possible to predict. Because when we did the work on the European cryptates, monoclonal antibodies were just starting to be known. So it's an illustration of a case where one has interesting results in one area, other interesting results develop in another area, and it happens from time to time they come together. And generate new applications and new technologies. The second example I would like to present in terms of illustration of possible applications. I could give you many more of those, but okay. I think you have understood. I'll just give you one because it's a case where you see quite nicely also how this can be used. Basically, if you are in a drug company and you want to make an inhibitor for a given enzyme, like a protease, and in the AIDS virus, one type of compound that is trying to find is an inhibitor of the proteases of HIV, of the, of the AIDS virus. And this can be done in the following way. You try to find inhibitors. You see, you take a piece of protein which is the site where cleavage occurs by the enzyme. You label it on one end with a cryptate, on the other end with the other emitter. 
So as long as the chain is complete, this transfer of energy, and you can recover this signal with a long lifetime, as I said. Now, if the protease is active, we will cleave the chain, we will cleave the chain, and then, by the cleavage, this transfer does not occur anymore. So if you make a chemical compound, which is an inhibitor of the enzyme, the enzyme will not cleave, and your signal will remain. And so you can test for the activity of the compounds. So these are just two examples of what can be done in this area. Let me, in view of the time, I won't go through all of this, but let me just indicate that in addition to devices which handle photons, one can also try to make devices which are active on electrons. And these are then molecular electronic devices where the idea is can we do on the level of a molecule or a few molecules processes can be introduced processes which are normally associated with an electronic component. Now what are electronic components? Because always a wire. Because the thing is a wire to lead to to connect one thing to another thing. And wire for electrons. This would be on the molecular level a molecule which can help electrons to go through an insulator. What insulator? For instance a membrane, a cell which is uh, impermeable to electrons, but you could put, but put a wire which helps electrons to go one side and the other side. You can polarize this wire by putting a donor group, an acceptor group, but then electrons will go one way, easier than the other way. That would be like a rectifier. Or you can put a photosensitive group along the way somewhere. If you put a photosensitive group along the way somewhere, you have an effect like a photodiode. If you excite this photosensitizer, you can, if the whole thing is done correctly, <coughs> help electrons to go from E to A. It is like a photodiode, like a photo excitable type of entity. This is especially interesting because, as you may know, in photosynthesis, the first step of photosynthesis is an excitation which separates charges. And this time is the origin of the accumulation of energy in photosynthesis. Now I haven't time to go into all of that, but let me just show you one case of electron transfer. And this was the synthesis of a molecular wire, transmembrane electron channel. And this is done in the following way. We synthesize the molecule, which is a long chain of double bonds conjugated. We attach on each side two pyridinium group, which is an electron acceptor group. And now you can introduce that into a membrane, a phospholipid membrane, and look at the possibility to transfer electrons from outside to inside. To the inside here. This can be done by observing optical changes. If you put ferricyanide inside and a reducing agent like sodium dicyanide outside, you can watch the way in which the rate at which a ferricyanide is reduced to ferrocyanide, as a change in absorption coefficient, in absorption spectrum, and you can then follow this in presence and absence of the wire, and you find out that indeed the introduction of the molecular wire in the vesicle leads to a faster transfer of electrons and a faster reduction of the inside ferricyanide to ferrocyanide. One could do and develop many other things by which one can show that it's possible to introduce a switch on the wire. I haven't time to talk about that, but you can introduce a switch which opens and closes the conduction along the wire. 
You can make substances which have electrons, ions both for membranes, models of channels, and this is an area which has been very much developed also in many groups, especially the important feature of uh, trying to synthesize artificial channels for ions is something which is still very, very active and uh, has been on the biological side very important because we have in our cells molecules which directly may help potassium or sodium to go through, or calcium, or water. And in fact, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry last year, for example, the three have been awarded for ion channels and the structure of ion channels and the mechanism of biological ion channels. Now, since I speak about transport through a membrane, like electrons going through or ions going through, let me give you a second example of an application which came out also of basic studies. At the beginning of the 1970s, we studied, in addition to recognition, another of these basic functions which I had indicated earlier, this basic function which is, in addition to recognition, I won't talk about transformation catalysis, but I want to give you one example of transport. You have already seen transport of electrons to the channel mechanism. I have mentioned ion channels for the transport of potassium and sodium. And let me just show you another process of transport and illustrate the application which results from that. A membrane in a cell or in an artificial liposome, artificial vesicle, is impermeable to highly polar substances. Ions cannot go through like that. and have to help them in some way to go through. So I can try to design a carrier molecule which will transport substrate from one side to the other one in a mechanism which is a shuttle mechanism where the carrier binds the ion on one side, diffuses through, releases it and comes back empty and just does that transporting. And of course, this transport is selective because only the substrate which is bound will be transported. Now this was studied in great detail. We did a lot of studies on sodium, potassium transport, on the transport of many other substances, and this sort of developed. And then after some 10 years, in the 1980s, we dropped it because we thought, okay, we have not done enough of that. Then it took about another 10 years until a new topic came up, which again was very interesting for transport, but a completely different area. What was it? 10 years later, that means in about the 90s, it was apparent that one could hope of using artificial molecules to transfer a gene into a cell do gene transfer for gene therapy. What is a gene? It's a piece of DNA. So the problem is, can we transport a piece of DNA into a cell? Now, DNA is highly negatively charged, you know that. It's a polyanion, many, many negative charges. It is very soluble in water. It does not want to go through a membrane. So you have to find a way to help it go through the membrane into the cytoplasm of the cell. Words, we want to do the following. We want to help the gene, DNA, to go through the cell membrane into the cell. Of course, at that stage it's not finished because many other processes have to occur. It has to go into the nucleus, it has to be then uh, transcribed into RNA, and then has to be transformed into the proteins. Let's forget about all these very complicated processes. The first step is to get DNA into the membrane. DNA is negative. So if we are simple-minded, and simple ideas are often very good ideas, you say negative, okay, you want to put it, you want to neutralize the negative charge. You need something positive. In addition, you want to go through a membrane, which is lipophilic, it's a grease. So you want a positive charge with some grease on it. That's a very simple idea. And then you can try to make, wait a minute, greasy positive charges, cationic lipids. 
and then this cat will give it to following. They should take the DNA, usually in the blue start to make a construct of a psychic DNA, a plasmid. You introduce into this plasmid the, the gene you want to transfect, and you have to synthesize that cationic lipids, that's again some lesson in French. This will bind to the DNA, lead to little particles by compacting it, and this DNA is compacted, and then the outside will put it in, and it will hopefully go into the cell and then go into the endosome, and then the endosome release the DNA, and then the DNA will go to the nucleus, they get to go in the nucleus, and then a lot of things happen. But, okay, you have then two things you can do. Either you wait until you understand all the processes from the DNA outside to the protein generated inside. They have to wait until you understand everything. That's very, very complicated. But uh, the best is also just to try. You have a simple idea, and you try to see whether it works. That's an important word for chemistry. Does it work, as you know? Uh, so we developed a series of those cationic uh, lipids with the idea that they might perhaps be able to transport a gene into a cell. The basic, then you have to tip to say, OK, what type of molecule do we want to make? The idea then was simply the following. One knows that the proteins which regulate gene expression, histones, attach to the genes, the DNA, through positive charges, usually, at least some of them, important ones being the guanidinium groups of arginines, the amino acid arginine. So that was said, okay, maybe good to use guanidiniums. Secondly, membranes contain lipids like cholesterol. Okay, cholesterol could be a good thing to go to the membrane. And this translates the synthesis of this compound here, 